Hi, Krishna, everybody. Nice to, uh, nice to be back. I could say it's nice to see you, but I'm just seeing a camera. But uh, there's a lot of happy faces, I hope, behind that camera. Um, my apologies. Uh, we really haven't done this for a while, but I think I've got a good reason that you can all relate to, and that's called 2020. And uh, another, another word for 2020 is called COVID-19. So you're all living through it. We're all living through it. Uh, in fact, I even lived through it, literally speaking, because I also had it. And, uh, and it's really upset a lot of things in the world. So it's sort of uh, thrown us a little out of kilter as well in terms of how we're able to do some of these live uh, question and answer sessions. But here we are. And... I got tons of uh, great questions. I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer all of them. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, for those of you who sent them in. Uh, we haven't really tagged anyone's name or location to this because quite a few people have asked us not to. So they're just the questions. Uh, and uh, let me just start in so that we don't uh, really waste any time. Hare Krishna, Prabhupada Ki Jai. First question, monks are celibate. True. Continues, but why do they have to be? Can't you achieve the same thing while in a relationship? Uh, you know, the whole idea of celibacy, which is there, for instance, in Catholicism for priests, uh, and it's not just there for priests, but it's also there for nuns, uh, is that God is the singular most important person in your life, and you are solely and wholly, fully dedicated to him without any distraction to any other family member. And you see the greater family of the whole world. Uh, and that's why celibacy uh, is there. And I'm going to speak a few words about celibacy. Uh, can someone who's in a relationship also achieve the same thing? Well, my question would be if I was speaking to that person, what do you mean by relationship? Now, if the relationship is what I call a relationship, which is a soul-to-soul -soul connection where two people or multiple people, in other words, we're talking about a family, uh, are living together with the idea of helping each other grow spiritually, yes, in that relationship you can attain the same thing. But in other words, a relationship uh, whose purpose is spiritual growth, spiritual development. But if that relationship is about sensual enjoyment, it's about uh, enjoying uh, the body, and uh, it's about partying and so many other things, uh, then no. So, spiritual life, spiritual development means in itself giving up the lower material affinities uh, that we have towards sensual enjoyment of which there's unlimited types in our world today. So, if a relationship is trying to explore all of those sensual enjoyments, then no, you can't progress, uh, whether you're living alone or you're in a relationship. But if that relationship means how can we progress together, and we're willing to actually sacrifice material sense enjoyment for spiritual development, then yes, uh, you don't have to be a monk uh, in order to attain, in order to become self-realized in order to develop spiritually. So uh, it can happen. Uh, next question. I think we should find a middle ground between spirituality and material life. I meditate, but I also party and do wild things because you have to let go sometimes. If we become radical and reject all sorts of enjoyment, 
that's not healthy. What's my opinion on this? Uh, well, let me just start with this last part about my opinion. Uh, I don't like to say this is my opinion. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, I think watchers will know Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is our primary spiritual authority, spiritual text, and Krishna is the speaker. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Matir Mama, this is my opinion. Well, God's entitled to his opinion because his opinion uh, ends up being the absolute truth. Uh, I don't give my opinion. I try to voice the opinion of God as it's come down to me through a chain of disciplic succession to my spiritual master. So I'm just repeating what I've heard, but what I do that's sort of unique to me is I speak in a certain, to a certain culture at a certain time and uh, place, uh, and uh, I use terminology and examples that are commonplace uh, to today. Uh, it's something that may be more easily relatable to than examples in some previous centuries or millennia past. So the essence or the principle is the same, uh, but maybe some of the details are different. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the previous question. Uh, you have to let go, do wild things. Well, it depends what you mean by having to let go. You, I meditate, but I also party. Well, I meditate and I party too. The question is whether my partying is the same type of partying than uh, this person who's asking a question. What's my party? Well, my party is chanting Hare Krishna. I'm dancing and singing. Of course, at 72, my dancing is getting a bit curtailed, but still, I'm partying. Uh, and we have a good time and we have festivals and we eat, but what do we eat? We eat wonderful, vegetarian things that have been sanctified and offered to the Supreme. So I party, but my type of partying is not separate from worshiping God. Uh, it's a form of praise. Uh, it's a form of love. So it's not a form of degradation, as he's seeing here, letting go, do wild things. No, we don't let go. You can't let go. Uh, if you want to hold on to something, you can't let go of it. If you want to hold on to spiritual life, you can't let it go. So if you want to progress, this is a progressive thing. You have to keep developing and growing. This is what life is about. Life is about, well, meditation. I don't know what our questioner asks, means by meditation, uh, but their, uh, meditation is a progressive thing, it's something to learn, and in itself, it's something in which you have to go deeper and deeper and deeper, whatever form of meditation that you're doing. Uh, for instance, our meditation, mantra meditation, uh, the mantra may be the same, but the attainments in the mantra uh, go on a step-by-step -step process up and up and up. And it's dependent on sticking to certain principles uh, that you can't undermine. So it's just like building a fire. You want to build a fire, you put wood on it. If you put water on the fire, you put it out. So going wild, partying, material activities, intoxication, gambling, sex, meat eating, and so on, these things put out the fire of spiritual life. So anyone who knows anything about spiritual life means that it means spiritual discipline. Anything you want to achieve in this world requires discipline. When you let go, you lose it. And the same thing happens with real spiritual practice. Okay, here's the next question. God created the world in a way that sooner or later, every soul learns their lesson and reaches enlightenment. So why should we make separate efforts to achieve it? I don't know, when I read a question like this, I think this chap, it must be living in an alternate reality to mine. He must be living in another universe. Uh, 
Uh, maybe he does a lot of Star Trek and has gone somewhere else to another planet. The world that I live in, I don't see people learning their lessons. I see just the opposite. Just look at what's been going on in the world in the last couple of hundred years. Uh, just recent history shows how human beings are not learning their lesson. They're not becoming better people. They don't care about their environment. They don't care about each other. They don't care about themselves. All they think about is some immediate thrills and everything is measured uh, in terms of likes, in terms of social media, in terms of fads, in terms of fashion, in terms of what's fashionable and what some trender or what some uh, brainless influencer uh, is doing somewhere else in some other part of the world. People are not... Uh, learning their lesson, and people are not advancing spiritually, they're going down. And this whole premise that this is the way God created the world, well, this is not what the Bhagavad Gita says. In Bhagavad Gita, God says that those who neglect him, tato yanti tata gatim. Uh, let me read word for word. Such persons can never approach me. Gradually, they sink down to the most abominable existence, which means that they go from human species to other species, dog and cat and fish and tree and insect, because they go down. Why? Because they neglect that thing for which we're here. And we are here for one thing. We're here to learn how to know God and to love God. And this is a very easy mantra, know God and love him. In order to love him, you have to know him. And if you want to know him, well, there's a lot there to know. Uh, therefore, we should learn those things that really relate to the science of loving God and knowing God. So no, God didn't create the world like that. It's just like saying that, you know, a, uh, I don't know, a university educational institution is created like that, that ultimately everyone <laughs> graduates. I don't know, I spent six years in university, it wasn't like that. Uh, unless you work, you fail. You know, it's not, don't just sit in the pews and automatically everyone goes through. No, you work and you study. And that's what spiritual life is about. Spiritual life is about study. It's about work. It's about applying ourselves all the time and energy. And in our world today, people put in a phenomenal amount of energy in education. And they educate themselves for some particular profession. Well, that much energy, at least, you have to put into, and time, into really becoming self-realized. It isn't like just falling off a tree. It's a lot of hard work. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems, is we put so much energy into this aspect of our profession that we got really hard time in putting extra time into spiritual life. We usually put the minimum, because living in the world already takes so much of our time. That's why it's a good thing not to get too entangled, because we need the time. That is what life is meant for. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. Vegetarianism is all about nonviolence. Hitler was a strict vegetarian, yet he did horrible things. What's the explanation to this? He did horrible things. You all know it. At least I hope you all know it. I don't even like mentioning his name. Uh, but maybe being a vegetarian, it shows you. Just because you're vegetarian doesn't mean that you're good. Good people are vegetarians. But... Vegetarianism is just an aspect of being good. It doesn't paint the whole picture. So the real question comes out is, what is a good person? Who's good? And we often say that, oh, he's such a nice person. He's a good person. But is he? Or is she? Uh, what what uh, determines whether somebody is actually good? We have a lot of uh, relative uh, measures of that. So we may consider that someone who's, well, this is a, he's a good parent, he pays his taxes, uh, he's very kind and generous, but 
every and every weekend he packs everybody in the car and they go off to uh, A and W uh, and or McDonald's and they have a, a burger dinner and so on. Maybe doing some good things, but not good. If you want to fill in the picture of being good, you got to fill it all in. And the most important part of being good is that your main interest in life is pursuing spiritual development. That has to be the key. That's the most important. And then you have to cultivate how you walk, how you talk, how you deal with other people, the type of profession that you have, uh, how you educate your family, how you interact uh, with uh, other people. It's a, it's a big picture. But the essence of that big picture, the focal part of the picture, it's just like you may have a Mona Lisa. So, all right, there's a background, but ultimately it's the face that's counting, the face and the smile. So similarly, uh, you may have all these background qualities of being a vegetarian and uh, a nice person and a nice parent and a taxpayer and so on. But if you're not a knower of God and a lover of God, then you're not a good person. At least not by the determination from the absolute uh, perspective of the Bhagavad Gita. So good means God. If God's not in the picture, then it's hard to be good. It's a type of relative goodness, but unfortunately, relative things are relative, which means that they degrade. Anything that's relative decreases and falls apart. The only thing that stays together is that's absolute, and the only way something becomes absolute is if the absolute is in the center. So God has to be in the center. And not just God the word, but actually God the person. And and yes, when we're talking about God, obviously, we're talking about a person, not a person like me or a person like any of you, but we're talking about the supreme personality of God. We're talking about the supreme being. That's part of knowing God. So God isn't a concept. God isn't an energy. And although God is loving, he's not just love. He's more than that. He's all of those things, but he's more. Uh, And he's a person. So knowing that person and having that person as the most important person in my life, that's a good person. And conversely, let me just bring it around and then move on to the next question. Uh, There's a verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which continues on from the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, It's a, uh, it's my spiritual master, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's. It was his life mission to translate Srimad Bhagavatam into English. There were already many translations of the Bhagavad Gita in English, uh, but there wasn't any of Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's very, it's 18,000 verses. So it's in 32 volumes. Uh, and uh, in there it states in Sanskrit, Yasyasti Bhakti Bhagavati Akinchana Sarvaguna Statra Harasati Sura. It says that, but if you're a God fearing, God knowing person, and you don't have all these other qualities, the other qualities will come naturally. Why? Because you're properly anchored. So the other the other things will develop in time. We have the examples. Sometimes people come to us and they're very interested in spiritual life. They're very serious seekers, but they still have some habits. I don't know, someone may be still attached to smoking cigarettes. Uh, Sometimes uh, every once in a while someone has a drink. Uh, But because that pursuit of the Supreme is there, ultimately that fire burns up all of this other trash in their life and you become a good person. So that's how someone becomes a good person, even though superficially he may have bad habits. Okay, let's move on and go on to the next one. I'm trying to uh, visit as many questions as I can. Why repeat the mantra so many times? Is it not enough to just focus on uttering it with love as opposed to repeating it all the time? Yes. 
if you can say the mantra with love, uh, then in one sense, the obligation to be repeating the mantra all the time is fulfilled. But the real question is, are you saying it with love? And what is love? So very important, very relevant question. Uh, the whole principle of mantra chanting, the whole principle of meditation, the whole purpose of religion is always the same. Know God and love God. Once you know God, then you can actually really love him because you can't love somebody you don't know. You can't love a concept. So you have to, you have to love a person. So And you love a person. When you love a person, you love a person's name. So when we're talking about mantras, uh, and for instance, the mantra, you know, we're chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. So there are two types, basically two types of mantras. Those which are directly the names of God and those which are not names of God but which indicate the God. For instance, uh, Om. So Om doesn't immediately, isn't a name of God, but it indicates God. It indicates the Supreme. It's a real, it's an acronym, you could say. It's the original spiritual acronym for God, Om. But no one necessarily likes to be addressed as an acronym. They like to be addressed by their name. So God also has unlimited names. And mantras that are composed of those names uh, are the more powerful uh, and most potent way uh, of meditation. And that's the meditation that's recommended in this age. The other type of meditation that's very much popular but it's, uh, it's really an outdated process uh, for many reasons, one of which is that it takes a long time. We don't live that long anymore. You know, we're lucky if we uh, reach 100. Uh, the other uh, is uh, that it also requires a very peaceful environment. People would live in the, in the forest. That isn't what happens nowadays. So therefore, scriptures, because that's where meditation comes from. It also, it also comes from Bhagavad Gita. The process of meditation, there are different spiritual processes recommended according to the age and according to people's ability. And in this age, the mantra chanting, uh, the Hare Krishna mantra chanting uh, is what's recommended. So, but we don't have love. We want to develop it. Real love means loving God. It means selfless desire to serve the uh, senses and the order of the supreme. That's what love means, that I want to please somebody else. So when I have this overwhelming urge and desire uh, to please some other person with no benefit for me, even if that person doesn't reciprocate with me, that urge is called love. That love makes you want to do that. As soon as you want something, that's already not pure love. That's already uh, selfish. So when you develop love for God, you also have love for everything that's related to God, and you also love God's name. And we have experience even when we become infatuated with someone in this world, then their name is like the most beautiful thing. So, same thing, Romeo, Romeo, where frauds are. Romeo sounds like a beautiful sound vibration. So why? Because I love a person, therefore I love, love their name. I love everything that's uh, to do with it, anything that reminds me of them. Uh, even if it's just a rose, uh, simply that that I received a rose from my beloved, then it's just like any other rose. But no, this is a special rose uh, because it's come from the person that I love. So when it's a fact that the process of chanting, the discipline of chanting is meant to awaken love for chanting. And when technically you've awakened love for chanting, you don't need to do any more discipline. But then you continue the chanting because you can't stop. 
because you have love. And love isn't something that you just stop. It's just like this flowing river. And, uh, you know, just like recently in India, uh, this uh, river just washed away this dam, if you look at it. And it's all this uh, concrete all of a sudden just disappeared. It was like some uh, kid making something with a, a little mud dam. So similarly, love is like that. Love just, you can't stop anything. Nothing stands in its way. It just pushes everything out of the way. And therefore, yes, people will continue to chant the mantra. While I'm a vegetarian, many times I read about animals not having souls or being categorized in a different soul group as they're acting out of instinct. Could you clear this up for me? It's sad. I've I've heard this ever since, ever since, uh, ever since I became a vegetarian. Uh, and when I became a vegetarian, uh, some some of my in-laws thought that uh, I needed to go see a psychiatrist. Uh, but uh, this argument comes up, and unfortunately, it's infiltrated most religious circles that I've seen, most faiths, uh, the idea, this philosophy, that animals have a different soul than we do. And what to speak of animals, what about trees and insects and so on, and fish? So this comes from a misunderstanding of actually what is the self and what is the soul. And unfortunately, for the most part, it's very rare that I've ever met a person in this world who knows who they are, which is a real problem because you would think that this is, uh, this is something that's important to everybody uh, and that it's the first thing that everyone should be taught in terms of education. Okay, listen, this is it. Uh, This is self 101. Uh, You're learning who you are. Isn't that an important thing? But have you ever been to a class that teaches you who you are? No. One problem is there's no teacher to tell you who you are. So it's a very rare person. And those of you who are there and who are inquisitive and want to actually develop spiritually are a very rare breed because you're interested and who you are, and this actually means intelligence. Uh, that, you know, I want to know. And it, uh, I mean, you know, I was stuffed uh, full of so much knowledge for like 20 years of my life before it sort of occurred to me, isn't this important that I should know who I am? And it was when I met my spiritual master that he pointed out, hello, this is ABC. This is what you're supposed to learn uh, when you're in nursery. This is kid stuff. So it was a little embarrassing to start learning kid stuff when you're in your 20s. Uh, But anyway, better late than never. And we start with what is the self? And the self or the soul is the same. The soul is the same in a mosquito, in a whale, in a lion, in an elephant, in our body. It's the same soul. And it's so powerful. The energy that moves the body of a whale, the energy that moves my body. It's not a biological energy. That's a secondary energy that feeds off a primeval energy, an original energy, which is my soul. Because what happens to this body? As soon as the soul leaves, then, all right, all the chemicals are there, all the biology is there. Where's the energy? There's no energy. Energy is gone. So the soul is what gives energy to the body. And the soul is the same in each body. This is what a wise person is. A wise person sees. Pandita Samadarshana. Wisdom means to understand that everything that lives has the same life, and therefore they have the right to life. And the greatest right to life is to progress. For those that aren't humans, to progress up to the human stage. And for the humans, to use the very developed intelligence they have and the developed consciousness for self-realization. And this is what this sort of soul group refers to. The soul is the same, but the covering is different. So our souls are covered also. Otherwise, we wouldn't be an illusion. We wouldn't be here to start with. Like Mark Twain says, the good ones aren't here. The good ones never left. That's the exact quote. In other words, the good ones never left heaven. If you left heaven, you're not good. If 
you're here, you're not a good person. What are you doing here? So prison. How many good people are in prison? Well, there's no good people in prison unless my mistake they got there. Anyway, but you don't get here by mistake. You get here by choice. So the soul is the same, but we're covered. And we're covered by lust and greed and anger. And anyway, you know the list. We're covered by these things. And therefore, the consciousness, the original power of the soul becomes covered. Now, for a mosquito, he's really covered, more than we are covered. And the dog is less covered. And different. there is a hierarchy. There's an evolution of consciousness. There's no such thing as the evolution of species. The only person who devolved was Darwin and the people who follow him and propagate the same stupidity that they teach in university about evolution. It doesn't exist. But what does exist is the evolution of consciousness, that the soul evolves from lower stages of consciousness to higher. Why? Because it attains bodies uh, in which they are less and less covered by the influence of matter, which unfortunately we've embraced. So that's the difference between us and animals and other species of life. Uh, Otherwise, a soul, spiritual entities were all the same. It's spiritual, very draining to live in today's world. How can we protect ourselves from the aggressive, envious, and materialistic mood that surrounds us every day, especially at work? How can we remain spiritually intact? Real important question for those of you who are really want to progress forward, but at the same time, we're living in the world. I mean, I'm living in the world. I'm not like uh, hidden away somewhere uh, in, uh, uh, on a mountaintop. Uh, I, right now, I'm in the middle of Budapest. Uh, and we also live here. We work here. We have maintain an institution. We interact with uh, people. Uh, but obviously, I'm doing it in a different way than, for instance, someone who's going to work going into an office or going to a place of business, interacting with all different types uh, of people, having to hear different types of things, see different types of things, being tempted, or to speak of uh, being uh, disturbed uh, sometimes. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very difficult. What do we do? Well, this is what I do, and this is what we do every morning. We have what's called a morning program which is a regulated program that's meant to give us the spiritual strength to do what we need to do in order to live in this world, which may be going out and selling books. So we go for our food distribution. We chant on the street. We go out and meet people. And people also need to do so many other things. Now, what does that morning program entail? Well, we rise early, uh, you know, usually four o'clock is the latest, and we have a little kirtan, 4.30 in the morning. It's a worship. And then after that, we have meditation. So we have mantra meditation where we're chanting Hare Krishna, as I mentioned earlier. We're chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. That meditation is on beads like this, These are my meditation beads. There's 108 beads. There's one mantra on each bead. And now I have a vow that I chant a minimum of 16 times 108 mantras every day. Quality. Meditation. So then we do that. Then after that, we have uh, a a class. We have a a seminar uh, on uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, on scripture. And this becomes our morning program. From this, we get spiritual strength, spiritual inspiration, and we get a type of uh, insulation to protect us from what's going on outside in the world. And this is a similar type of thing that I would recommend others to do. Basically, if you want to get up, obviously you get up and you clean yourself, do a little yoga, uh, if that fits in your schedule as well. So a little yoga, and then from yoga we go to 
uh, mantra meditation, studying scripture every day. The same quantity, obviously quality can improve, but you do the same. If you're going to chant one times around on the beads, uh, then you stick to it every day. If you're going to read, here's the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita has so many verses. You can see, here's the Sanskrit, word for word. Here's the actual translation, and then an explanation. If you read just one verse a day of the Bhagavad Gita, and that becomes your daily meditation, okay, this, this becomes like my screensaver on my computer for the day, or this is what pops up on my uh, telephone instead of a picture, I don't know, family picture, a picture of my uh, pooch, uh, then I got a, a, a picture of this ver verse, and I can meditate on that for the day. That gives you spiritual strength. It's like your PPT outfit. You know, just like the doctors are going into the hospital, uh, they're taking care of the COVID patients, doctors, nurses, uh, all of these health workers, phenomenal, risking their lives. But they've got, well, they've got vaccine, they've got their outfits that they're dressed in. So they're with the sick patients, but they don't get sick. Although, some do, but the idea is that you don't get sick. So the same thing. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're separated from it. It's like you're in the ocean, but when you're in the boat, you're in the ocean, but the ocean doesn't disturb you, doesn't bother you. Even though the waves may be tossing you up and down a little, but they don't toss you. So do a regulation. And I can't emphasize this enough. And then if you think, well, I'm doing that, but I'm still getting affected, then do more. It's just like scales, set of scales. So here is the weight of the material association and the oppressive world that we live in. So if that's weighing you down and you want to counterbalance that, then just put more on this side. Put more in the spiritual side. And as the spiritual goes down, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, then you just outweigh this other side until it becomes insignificant. So do more. Read two verses of Bhagavad Gita a day. Read three. Uh, and chant more. So the more that you give emphasis, you get that protection. And as I mentioned, that doesn't mean that you have no relevance to the world. Uh, just see that picture of a boat. You're sitting in a boat, and the boat is in the water. So you're on top of the water. The waves still toss you up and down. And if you're not very good at being in boats, then you may get a little seasick. But nonetheless, you're not wet. Sharks don't get you. So you're protected. It's a different experience than being in the water. So stay in the boat of spiritual practice and you're doing good. How can we love ourselves if no one taught us how to do that? Yes, no one taught us how to do that. Uh, there, therefore, we can't love ourselves. But the problem is no one taught us how to love. I had already mentioned earlier uh, what love means. Love means unconditional willingness to serve the supreme. And when that's there, then you will know how to love everybody else. Why? So I'll give you an example. Uh, an example is that uh, if, uh, here's my hand. How do I keep my hand uh, healthy? I, I eat. If I eat, then food goes in my mouth to my stomach and it nourishes my hand. If I think I'm going to just mush the food around in my hand. Well, first of all, I'm going to get really dirty hands. Second of all, uh, my hand is not going to get nourished. It only gets nourished through the stomach. And so does every other part of my body. So what is the source of existence? The source of existence and the source of everything, including love, is God. When love goes to the supreme, then it's distributed to everyone and automatically the relationships 
become functional. Otherwise, when you try to have a direct relationship with someone, uh, and that direct relationship may be with yourself, cutting out God, well, it's like trying to have direct relationship with the food. You can mush it around. You may want to call that eating, but you're getting thinner and thinner all the time, and you're not getting satisfied. So you may make up all kinds of ideas uh, about loving yourself and loving your neighbor and loving mankind and loving others and so on through the direct path. You can call it love, but that's not what it is. It's something else. You just use the word. It may be attachment and so on. And we see it doesn't have substance. They don't last. Uh, I fall in love and then I fall out of love. What happened? It wasn't really love because you don't fall out of love. So if you want to learn how to love ourselves, learn to love God and you will love yourself. You will appreciate yourself because first of all, you know who you are. And obviously, as we spoke about earlier, if you want to love yourself, know who you are. Otherwise, how can you love yourself if you don't even know who you are? And then you'll love yourself You'll appreciate yourself. Why? Because you know you're doing what's good for you instead of doing what's destructive for you. Alcohol, drugs, uncontrolled sensual habits, who knows what that leads to all kinds of anxiety and so on. It's not good for us. Therefore, how can you love yourself when you're doing something that's bad for you? But what's good for you is spiritual development and spiritual returning back to our original spiritual home. How can we treat panic attacks and depression in a natural way? Uh, I'm not a doctor. Uh, although uh, some slight experience I have with these things, there is, I know for instance, in Hatha Yoga, there are pranayam exercises that help manage these things. There's also herbal approaches to this. The chanting of mantra also helps to balance the life airs in the body and certainly helps to actually give us a sense of well-being, identity, and so on. Uh, if these things work, then that's the natural way. Uh, ultimately, actually, I don't say, think that anything is unnatural. In other words, that allopathic medicine uh, would be unnatural. Uh, it's also works, important thing is what is it that works, that keeps us sane, that keeps us healthy, so we can progress in spiritual life. Whatever that is, do it. And then of course there's also counselors, psychiatrists, uh, and those who can actually really help us uh, and give us, uh, give us guidance. Health, be it emotional health, mental health, physical health, uh, we need to have good health for good spiritual practices. Uh, ultimately, we know that as soon as you're not healthy, everything goes helter-skelter. This, this idea of depression, panic attacks, all of these things, these are already foretold in scripture. Manda, sumanda, manda bhagya, this word manda says disturb. Scripture says people in this age are extremely disturbed. We live in a very disturbed age. So World Health Organization says that in this century, the primary health problem is not going to be COVID. The primary health problem is emotional and mental health. These are the main problems for people nowadays. And yes, we, we live in an unnatural world. We're forced into such unnatural circumstances, therefore, naturally, we're very disturbed. Uh, so do, do the needful, my spiritual master would say, do the needful, keep good health, so that you can maintain yourself nicely, and of course, follow spiritual practices. I would like to raise my children in spiritual consciousness, but when they go to school, they get pressured into consumerism. I feel like I have no alternative, and so children cannot avoid bad association. Is there something I can do to counteract the negative influence of my kids' classmates? Uh, well, I'm in Hungary, we're in Europe. There are different 
legal alternatives uh, in different uh, countries. Now, where I lived for many years in the United Kingdom, 15% of the people home teach their children. That's a lot. There are also many other groups where parents get together and teach their children just because they're not satisfied uh, with the uh, moral uh, and human experience the children get in state-run schools. And then, of course, there's private schools, uh, but uh, that may be somewhat better. I just say maybe. Uh, there's a whole variety. But ultimately, yes, uh, parents' duty, parents' responsibility is to their children. And uh, unfortunately, modern educational institutions are more interested in what the children become, not who they become. In other words, who they are as people is no longer important as long as they're real producers and consumers. Uh, these are the uh, two real important things, that they should contribute uh, to the GDP and they should also consume and contribute to the GDP. So this is the important thing. And who you are and how you do that, ultimately even that's not so important anymore. But it is important, especially if you want to advance spiritually. I mean, what to speak of the spiritual aspect, the religious aspect. Uh, you know, we're living in a secular world where God is cut out of the picture everywhere. So yes, unfortunately, uh, if we send children to state school, but there is alternatives, they will be influenced. And counteracting that influence is, virtually speaking, impossible. Uh, peer pressure uh, for a teenager, uh, it's really difficult to counteract. Of course, the best thing is, uh, and I'll just repeat myself here, all right, take responsibility. It's your child, then you homeschool him and give them that type of uh, environment and that type of values and principles uh, that you uh, personally believe in and transmit that to them. And there the spiritual uh, is the most important. Uh, that basic spiritual training uh, of who I am, what the goal of life is, what about self-realization, and uh, teaching all these things, as well as qualifying them for some type of uh, profession uh, in, in the world, uh, if that's necessary. Now, if that's not possible, then of course the most important thing in any child's life is their parents' personal example. And if parents are personal example, uh, children grow up, they grow out of being teenagers and rejecting everything that they see from olders. Uh, their elders, they start seeing that uh, older people actually did know something. That's when they start to become a little older. So even if, uh, you know, they're so rebellious in their youth, but let them get a good few kicks from the world around them. Let them learn what suffering's all about. Let them be disappointed and so on. And then they start to wisen up. And then they remember when my parents told me all of this. And then, then they may be a lot more open. So it's not a lost cause. Uh, the most important thing, and this is a sort of rule of thumb in spiritual life, save yourself. Because you can determine uh, and you have control over one person, and that's yourself. You have no control over anyone else. You can just give them advice. Uh, okay, here's one. I believe in flow, which is a mental state of operation in which a person is fully immersed and focused in what she is doing and feels happy by that. Uh, I will feel what's good for me bodily and spiritually. It comes naturally. Now there's some, some wisdom in this unwise uh, question or statement, uh, and that is that if you can have that mental flow where you're immersed and focused in what you're meditating on, that's a very good tool. In of itself, it's worth nothing. So just like mind control, sometimes they have mind control. You control your mind, fine. Now, what are you going to do with your mind control? 
So if with your mind control you're going to concentrate on nothing, then you spent all your time for nothing. So it's worth nothing, or what to speak of, concentrating on some useless thing. But if you can meditate on the names of the Supreme, if you can meditate on God, okay, then that kind of flow is good. But just because you can fix your mind and be absorbed in something, that that doesn't mean anything. Uh, I mean, animals are absorbed in what they're thinking. Sometimes uh, we get very caught up. You know, people are partying. They're very caught up in the music. So the, that's a, you could say that that's really the flow uh, or that's a meditation. It's a really deep absorption. But what are they absorbed in? They're absorbed in dancing. They're absorbed in disco. They're absorbed in hearing, uh, I don't know who, uh, some uh, uh, rock star or some rapper. So it's an absorption, but where's the absorption getting you? Nowhere. And you may feel good about it, but you feel good about getting nowhere. But you're still getting nowhere. Feel good about it or feel bad about it. So feeling good is just a, it's just a feeling. It's just an emotion. It's a relative thing. Uh, but it's relative. Why? Because now you're feeling good and the next minute you're not feeling good. So it's not very spiritual. You have to develop, if you can develop that type of flow where you have two good words, immersed and focused, where you can immerse yourself and focus yourself on the Hare Krishna mantra, on the names of the Supreme, then you're doing good. Then you're focusing on something of value and you will really get transcendental benefit from this. Uh, and therefore that is uh, what I should uh, I suggest you focus on. Why should I accept your spiritual path? How do you know it's true? You say because your guru said so. But how do you know he's right? How do I find certainty? Well, either you do something or you do nothing. And if you do nothing and you just continue on either doubting or doing whatever you're doing, well, that's a choice also. And then who's the guru? But well, you're the guru. Then you follow yourself. How do you have certainty there? And life's real mess. And like Mark Twain says, what are you doing here if you're so smart? So not doing anything is not a uh, alternative. Therefore, we got to do something. Okay, now what do we do? And who are you going to follow? So are you going to, this is how we get educated. All right, you want to be something. Uh, where do you go to be something? Well, I go to the best educational institution. Uh, why? Because other people have recommended it. And they've said, yes, I've become so learned. I've become such a successful such and such doctor by going to this medical school. So you should also go there if you want to be a doctor. So same thing. I've seen. Why do I follow my guru? I follow my guru because I've seen that Everything that he said, he practiced. I've seen that he's a perfect person. I've seen that he's truthful, he's honest. I see that he's full of the good qualities that we mentioned before. And I see that he knows God, and he also loves God. And he can tell me who God is, and where he lives, and what he looks like, and what he ate yesterday. So, and he's not the only person. And what he said isn't that he dreamt something up, but he's also repeating something that he heard from his guru, who heard from his guru, and Asita, Deval, and Narada Vyasa, and these are all people of spotless character. So who am I going to follow? Someone I have to follow. Everyone's got to follow someone. I follow myself. I follow some rascal. I follow someone who has no good character, no good qualities, uh, who's uh, just a... Uh, so many things I could name, but anyway, I won't, time short. So you know what people are of low character and the things that they do, or I follow someone of good character. So follow someone of spotless character, and someone of spotless character who knows God, who actually repeats what God has said, and I see the result. I'm not just going for something that on the last moment before I die, then all of a sudden the lights are going to turn on. The lights are turning on. 
And they're systematically turning on day by day. And day by day, I experience that things I've been taught work. And I see the results. And I see the increasing results. And I realize those truths, which I've also read both in the scripture and heard from my guru. Good question. One more. Last one. Let's see. How can I get my family to be interested in spirituality? Don't be pushy. Do it yourself. Practice yourself in such a way that uh, you're not rocking the boat. And let them see the change in you. And let them see how it's good. But if you try to push too much too fast, it could cause tension. So be very careful. You talk a lot about mantra meditation. I've tried it, but I'm unsure. How do I know that I'm doing it the right way? Well, first try to chant the right mantra. Second, sooner or later, you have to connect with others who are doing it. Uh, for instance, we have centers around the world uh, where people will give, of course, nowadays, uh, it's not such an easy thing to walk into anywhere with COVID restrictions and so on and lockdowns. But there's also online, just like we're doing, online courses on how to chant the mantra. How does the mantra chanting go from strength to strength to strength? And how does that development take place? And one gets the taste. How do I know I'm doing the uh, right thing when I'm eating, where I'm putting the food in my mouth, because I can taste it. And I taste the result, because the result of the chanting is that my heart becomes purified. My consciousness changes. Before, we talked about the different consciousness levels of different living entities. But humans' consciousness is also meant to be pure. We have our consciousness is covered, And our original, pure, unfettered consciousness is when we see everything in connection with God. Because God is everywhere. He's in everything. God has created everything. So that consciousness is called Krishna consciousness. And as you progress closer and closer, then the uh, proof is in the tasting. Then you will see the result. I could answer more questions, but uh, our time's time's up. Before I go, I just wanted to mention that uh, this is our first book, uh, which is out on the videos that we do. These are from the different uh, videos over the past years, and uh, the scripts have been transformed into digestible, readable uh, material, into eight different chapters, eight different titles. Uh, You may find these uh, very interesting for, again, daily meditation. There's uh, 87 meditations here for the day. Uh, They're available here. You can just write in or you'll see everything, all the information uh, underneath here. And uh, you can order one of these. It's called The Swami and Life in a Faltering World. I hope it's, uh, it's of help. And for those of you who don't have a Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gitas are also available from our web shop. Uh, this is uh, translated into English and commented upon by my spiritual master, who's the founder and the Acharya of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Uh, it's a wonderful Bhagavad Gita. 30 million have been published. And... There are many editions you can get elsewhere. This is the only Bhagavad Gita who has made people devotees of Krishna. Must be a reason for it. Thank you all very much. Last thing, take care wherever you are. Uh, We're living in dangerous times. The world is always dangerous. Uh, Now the latest danger is called COVID-19. Look forward to seeing you soon. All the best and Hare Krishna. Thank you.